Do you like music or do you like noise? Well, our God likes to make music and not noise. There's a, a special person in our congregation that's very musically gifted. And about 20 years ago, call into existence this band of over 70 members and had this band going for 20 years. And one of my favorite gatherings is when this conductor, this band leader, would bring this group to... Uh, a park in Lake Oswego on July 3rd and hear band music outside, outdoors, patriotic music. It was just incredible. But to take a group of over 75, 70 musicians and all be doing the proper thing so it makes music and not a bunch of noise. It's a glorious and wonderful thing. God doesn't want our church, or any church for that matter, or for us individually, to make a bunch of noise, but God has called us as being the greatest conductor and being the greatest orchestra leader that calls us into his mission and for us to fall in and do what the Lord has called us to do. And when we do, oh, it's glorious. But you know what? <laughs> Sometimes you and I, and as a church, have the tendency, because we're broken people, to make a lot of noise. Our God is so good. He's so gracious. He loves you. And he's called the church today, tomorrow, and forever until God calls us back to him in the end of time. He's called the church not to build walls, but to build bridges. He's called us to build bridges to one another. And as we read in Ephesians, we read in Romans, we read through the word as his disciples caught drift of this new movement of God, we see that God is doing this new thing. Hmm. Yet I'm a stubborn one. I like to do things that are just my favorite things to do. I have my own flavors and my own things that I like. But we know that our God doesn't have any flavorites. <laughs> He's called us to love all people. And that is what this message is all about. And it came in a unique way. It came by way of divine appointment. And I pray that you and I, once you hear what this is all about, about would earnestly want a divine appointment. Because it's pretty cool. It is good. It does the best for us, for the church, individually, for the world, for God. And we're going to learn about how to uh, raise up the possibility for us to have these incredible encounters with God so that we may not build walls, but build bridges so that people of all different flavorites <laughs> would come to know the greatness of our God. And it comes in Acts chapter 10. It is a fabulous story. And guess who the conductor is? It's God. God knows what he's doing. But the people that were called didn't quite know what it was. But one thing that they knew, there's two principles I want you to see right away. To make a divine appointment more likely. 
And I'll bring that up as we hear the story today. But this story is about a man by the name of Cornelius. So happened in this story was in a place called Caesarea or Caesarea. And it's on the coast of Israel, up north. And at the, about the same time, God hearkens and, and gets the attention of a man by the name of Peter. Recognize that name? One of Jesus' disciples. And gets Peter's attention in a place called Joppa. Do you know what happened in Joppa? Bible scholars. Um, there was a man by the name of Jonah that was trying to run away from God. Remember that story about Jonah? And he was supposed to go this way. And he went this way. And he went to the seaport of Joppa and to get away from God. <laughs> That's a mistake trying to run away from God. But also where this story takes place is also in Joppa, where Peter comes from Jerusalem and he goes to the coast, which is really close to Tel Aviv. And uh, right there um, goes to a man by the name uh, Simon the Tanner. And uh, Peter was on the roof praying, and there, and he's hungry, and God shows up. And at the same time, God shows up with this guy up the coast in Caesarea, and God shows up and shows this vision, and you have all this going on. But things need to play out in a certain way for this divine appointment to take place, okay? And what I'm trying to encourage you here is not only to see that God loves all people different flavors— but for us to be, so that we as individuals will enter into the drama of being divinely put into this divine appointment. Because I want to be one that is seeking God's appointment. I want you to be seeking God's appointment so God can use you in a marvelous and wonderful way. But oftentimes we'll miss out and we'll see what Cornelius did. And there's a couple of things I want to bring up to you that he did that would... Um, make it more possible for him to respond favorably to God's encounter. And I pray that you listen to this, because, boy, I want to encourage you to ask God this, in your own language, saying, God, will you give me a divine appointment? God, would, would, you, would you divinely, well, you're divine, God, would you, Place me, be, be, help me to be an instrument of your grace that I can be used for you <laughs> so your goodness can be known to the world and to my neighbors or wherever it might be. <laughs> Doesn't have to sound like that. But don't you want to have one of those divine appointments? I pray that you would take that on. I'm going to say it at the end too. Pray for a divine appointment. Pray that God would use you for his agenda. Pray that God would show up in such a way and use you. All right, here's the story. So Acts chapter 10, verse 1 to 23. Let's hear this great story, and then I'd like to share with you a couple of things that will help us to receive these divine appointments. Not to say that they're needed. God can do a divine appointment any way God wants to, but this will, this will help. At Caesarea, there was a, name, a man by the name of Cornelius, a centurion of what was known as the Italian Regiment. He and all his family were devout and God-fearing. He gave generously to those in need and, pay, and prayed to God regularly. Okay. What do we think is really godly about this? Look in verse 2. He... In his family were devout and what? He gave in all that were in need. He prayed to God regularly. Now, there is an assumption that I want to clear up here because it's really important. If you and I pray regularly, if we are devoutly, if we're devout and God-fearing, that if we pray to God regularly and give generously, will we be saved? When I asked this question, I asked it in a little bit different way and the people didn't know how to respond and, 
and maybe there is some uncertainty there because there's something in our culture that says, if I do the right things, if I pray enough, if I pray at the right times, if I say the right magic words, if I give to the poor, if I'm generous, if I'm devoutly for God in this way, then I will be saved. If I just do the right things, if I'm just religious enough, if I attend Sunday school and confirmation and and do all the right things, then surely I've got it. No. I know that fits the American way. I know that fits the way people think about it. But we're not saved. We're not made right in the eyes of God by what we do. Rather, God saves us by his mercy through Jesus Christ and the things that we do that are holy and devout and God-fearing and the things we do like generosity to those who need and pray regularly are all in response to what great God has graciously done for us. Amen? Amen. It's a gift that God gives us and all the religious things that we do is all based on our, God's relationship with us because we, he loves us and We're called to love him and love whom he loves. Sometimes we can go to church all our lives and doesn't quite get through. Even pastor's kids. My oldest, who's 27, is getting married in uh, Kalispell, Montana. And um, in his junior year of high school at West Lynn, he went to what is called Young Life. You ever heard of Young Life? We have Matthew Chestnut that's serving Young Life, and I'm just so thankful for him and the ministry he's doing. So my son Caleb started going to Young Life, and at one of the banquets, it's a banquet where they raise funds for Young Life and their ministry with teenagers. And they had an opportunity where all the high school juniors, I think at this time, or it might have been the seniors, they came up, and they just had, they're holding one thing. They're holding a cardboard sign. And on the cardboard sign is a statement on the front. And then you flip over the cardboard, and there was a statement on the back. And it was saying, this is who I once was, and you read it. And then you flip it over, and this is who I am now. And each one of them came up with something different. And my son came up, and I'm going, oh, What's going to be on that sign? And he had one sign like this, and it said right at the beginning, religion. Religion. And then he turned it around, and he he flipped it, and just like Caleb would do, just like I would do all the time, that something was a little quirky about it, because when he turned it around, it was upside down. But everybody knew what it was. And on the, up, up, on the other side, even though it was upside down, everybody got it. It said relationship. And what we learn here, and what I want to say to you, it's not about being religious. It's about a God who pursues us, that loves you and I more than anything and wants and desires a relationship to save us, to use us, to be used for his kingdom purposes. Ah. So when you hear about this guy, it's not because he was God-fearing and devout and gave generously that he was somehow saved or just good. One day at about three in the afternoon, he had a vision, and he distinctly saw an angel of God who came to him and said, Cornelius! And Cornelius stared at him in fear. What is it, Lord? He asked. The angel answered, Your prayers and gifts to the poor have come up as a memorial offering to God. It didn't save him. Now send men to Joppa to bring back a man named Simon who is called Peter. He is staying with Simon the Tanner, whose house is by the sea. And when the angel who spoke to him was gone, 
Cornelius called two of his servants and a devout soldier who was one of his attendants. He told them everything that had happened and sent them to Joppa. Now, there's two things I just want to bring up. Not to say a divine appointment to be used requires this, but I'll tell you, it's moving us in this direction that I believe we're going to have a lot more divine appointments, and this is what we see in Cornelius. One is, I'll, I'll say voice recognition. Do you guys have one of those handy-dandy phones that it will recognize your phone? And if you say those magic words, it will, it will say something and, and actually do, what, do something for you. It's like, um, hey, Siri. Call Seth Sorensen. Hey, Siri. Uh-huh. Call Seth. Calling Seth Sorensen, I phone. Get up, Seth. <laughs> there is a, a way for us to recognize the voice of God. Cornelius was getting tuned in. He was being mentored in the ways of God to hear his voice by spending time with him in prayer, by um, hearing his word. And we, too, can recognize God's voice by hearing his word. And as we get tuned in to him in his ways, in his character, in his love, we can recognize his voice and recognize what the world is. And you say, oh, that is not of God. Or that's just, that doesn't sound right. That just doesn't sound like God's nature, God's will, when we're familiar with his words. Are you with me on that? So recognizing his voice, we have the source of getting to know him better in Scripture, of recognizing. Cornelius recognized this is the Holy One of God. But there's something else. Cornelius didn't do what I do a lot. Cornelius didn't do what maybe you and I don't do all the time. Cornelius listened and heard, and he didn't say and wait it for later. He did now. Now. So he heard this word, and he says, I want you to go to Joppa, and I want you to go to this man's house from Simon the Tanners, and I, I want you to go to his house. I want you to send these servants to go for you. And what did the centurion do? Who knew and followed orders as his role was. He did exactly what was said. He made himself available. He saw it as first importance. He did it immediately. He was obedient. Those are all important things. And I pray that you and I, when we hear God's voice and he's calling out us and we're praying and we're hearing the prompting of his Holy Spirit, that we don't do this. Well, God, that's a great thought, but I'll do it later. Um, God, will you send someone else? That'd be, a, that'd be a, a Joppa thing for like Jonah. Jonah and Joppa. God, I, I'm not really available right now. I know that's important, but it's not first importance. What did Cornelius do that I'm thinking, oh, God, I want to be like this. He saw God's agenda is in first point of, of first importance. He knew that he, for him, as what he did is he needed to be available to the calling of someone higher authority, and he did. And he did it now, not later. Oh, I want to be like that. And so given those things of hearing the word of God and recognizing it, and then first importance, a priority, he went and did it, and he was obedient, immediacy, available, and he did it. And when those things happen, it gives more available, it gives the more chances, I would say, for us to be able to just see God work out in amazing and beautiful ways for these divine appointments to take place. 
And during the same time, guess what? Someone else was having a conversation with God. And let's carry on and see what, what's said here. About noon the following day as they were on their journey, they're on their way to Joppa and approaching the city, Peter went up on the roof to play, pray because he was at Simon the Tanner's place. He became hungry and wanted something to eat. He was hungry and he wanted something to eat. And while the meal was being prepared, he fell into a trance. He saw heaven opened in something like Ben and Jerry's and haagen coming from four corners of a sheet. No. What did he see? He saw this large sheet being let down to earth by its four corners, and it contained all kinds of four-footed animals as well as reptiles and birds. And then a voice told him, Get up, Peter! Kill and eat! Surely not I, Lord, Peter replied. I have never eaten anything unpure and unclean. The voice spoke to him again a second time. Do not call anything impure that God has made clean. This happened three times. You notice that God happens to talk to Peter three times. He said, I'm a, you're going to deny me three times. Then he says to him, I love you three times. Do you love me three times? And now, for good measure, he gives this vision to Peter three times. I wonder when he's saying this three times. All right, God, I know it's you. <laughs> It happened three times, and immediately the sheet was taken back to heaven. And while Peter was wondering all about the meaning of this vision, imagine, he was thinking about this. And of that time frame, there were dietary rules. There were purity rules. There, there's things in Scripture that's saying, this is how you're to live. This is what you're to eat, and this is what you're not to eat. This is how you were to live. And he sees this and he says, not I, Lord, I can't do this. This is against your word. This is against your way. And now God says, I'm doing something new. I'm bringing something in fulfillment. And he's going on, he's here saying this. So he's, he's considering all this together. And he hears this word, do not call anything impure that God has made clean. And that is what he's thinking and while Peter was wondering about the meaning of the vision, men sent by Cornelius found out where Simon's house was and stopped at the gate. You know, none of this would happen if Cornelius didn't hearken to the word, didn't recognize it, if he didn't obey and do what God is calling him to do. But he was available. He saw it as of first importance. And he obeyed. Oh, Lord, I pray that we'd be like that too and not just hear it. And so they, they called out asking if Simon was, was known as Peter was staying there. And while Peter was still thinking about the vision, the Spirit said to him, Simon, three men are looking for you. I love it. Simon's getting all these threes. All right, Lord, I remember you. I denied you three times. Oh, yeah, I love you. All right, I love you. I love you. <laughs> Hearing this three times in the message, now three visitors come to him. So get up and go downstairs. Do not hesitate to go with them, for I have sent them. And Peter went down and said to the men, I'm the one you're looking for. Why have you come? And the men replied, we have come from Cornelius the centurion. He is righteous and God-fearing man. He is respected by all the Jewish people. A holy angel told him to ask you to come to the house so that he could hear what you have to say. Then Peter invited the men into the house to be his guests. Do you see what made this divine appointment this divine appointment? Do you think we could possibly miss out on these divine appointments? I, I too don't recognize God and his word, 
We don't see it as his first importance. We make ourselves unavailable. We say, not now, Lord, later. And we miss the opportunity. You know what God does when those things happen a lot of times? God goes to another person or another church that God's word would be accomplished. But Cornelius did what the Lord said, and this divine appointment takes place. And now the rest of the story, and you can read the rest of it in chapter 10, but here's what happened. And so um, Peter welcomes these three visitors in, in Joppa, overnight. And then the next day, Peter and his friends go to Caesarea to meet Cornelius. And by this time, Cornelius is with his family, with his friends, and they're waiting expectantly for Peter. Could you imagine? They're waiting. And then as Peter arrives in and they seize this room, he asks him, well, why did you bring me here? And then now he's understanding about this. And, it, and God's word is saying, God does not show favoritism. God does not show partiality, that God doesn't show flavorites, that God doesn't just like this type of people and puts this one up on the shelf. He's saying, I love all people, and he's given them this new word that's incredible. And so now Peter gets it because he's with these Gentiles, people that are non-Jewish, people that were saying, oh, they're off limits. And now God's saying, I'm doing a new thing. You receive the Holy Spirit at Pentecost and the whole church is born. Now I'm expanding. It's for this message of salvation that is for all people of every race and every nationality, young and old, everyone. It's open for all. And guess what? For those that are not Jewish, <laughs> right here, guess what? It came from that great event starting from there. It was the first Gentile convert named Cornelius and his family, and they received the Lord. But what set it up? The divine appointment was when Peter came to Cornelius' house, full room, expecting the word. God raised him up on a silver platter to now share the good news. So what did Peter do? Now he finally sees it. He said, ah, oh, the animals, four sheets, Unpure, unclean, Gentile Jew. Ah, oh, the gospel, the good news of Jesus. Salvation is for all people. Oh, God wants me to build bridges, not build walls. This message is for every people. Isn't that a message we need to hear? Do you have people you don't like? Do you have people that you disagree with? Do you have some philosophies or ideologies that you feel are completely different of yours? And God is saying, don't let those be a wall. Build bridges, because I have called you to people of different ideology, different political parties, different ways of life. God has called us, no matter what skin color, God has called us to go out to all people, so the good news is for everyone. Do you believe it? But sometimes we believe it, but we don't do it. We know it's the truth, but we don't go. Hmm. And so Peter takes this opportunity and he shares the good news of Jesus Christ. He's saying this Jesus is the one that's come to make us complete. He's the one that offers this salvation to all people. And he shares about Jesus who came and lived and died and rose again. He says, if you believe in him, you too will be saved. And everyone that was in this household believed and received the Holy Spirit. And as they saw the Holy Spirit, they said, well, I know they're not Jewish. I know they, they've received the Holy Spirit. Let's have them baptized. And they were baptized. And then the mission just expanded. Hmm. Divine appointment. They acknowledged, both of them, that this was the Word of God. They saw it was immediate and they responded. And I think right now we have an opportunity to respond. Several months ago, our church came together and we said, you know what? I know God has called us to make an impact. 
God is calling us to reach a, a population in this neighborhood that are so filled with people here of that age category. And we're saying, God, I know you called us to more flavors, chocolate, vanilla, Rocky Road, whatever it might be. But God was saying, you know what? I want you to know that this people, these, this whole community is filled with a lot of men, a lot of younger men that don't know me yet. So, well, God, we, we don't, we need a musician. We went to pray and prayed for, for John, and John came. And we're looking for opportunities where we can reach younger men because we know if we reach younger men here, they'll bring their families, and we're praying, Lord, we want to be used. We want to show up for this divine appointment. I can't wait to see what God is going to do in this new season. But we got to be willing to be available. To not say later, but now. And to go. And so even now, we got, I, I got confronted uh, this last week. We met with our leadership team and he said, you know what? How are you going to reach young families if you don't have a ministry to children? So let's do it. So we prayed and said, well, let's get a children's director in here as soon as we can. And then today we see all these children that show up. So praise God for that. Let's respond today as a church. And I invite you at this time to please stand.